the, the quality generally doesn't tend to be fantastic. Um, okay, cool. We're live. Excellent. Um, all zero viewers will be happy now that we're live. Um, so we try and do these things um, as a community event, and the Hangouts is really just an idea to try and help those people who can't make it for other commitments to catch up afterwards. Uh, hopefully this month we've finally nailed down all of the technical issues, mainly revolving around my capabilities, um, being able to use a webcam and uh, a web browser. Um, Troy, who's going to talk um, in a little while, um, we're not going to broadcast um, his screen um, from his PC. He's going to talk about some interesting stuff tonight, like he always does. So you'll be able to follow along on the live stream um, or video on demand later and hear him talk, but you won't be able to see necessarily what he is talking directly about. I uh, highly recommend if you do um, see Troy talking elsewhere to get uh, down to talk, see him talk, because uh, he is always interesting. Um, we appreciate him coming along this evening. So let's get started. Um, guys, pizza in, the, uh, pizza in the corner over there, beer around the corner over there if you want to grab one. Um, haven't missed any yet, apart from me burbling on. Mm -hmm. Just going to get the screen share up here so people can see what we're talking about. All right. So hopefully everybody at home can play along with us. So as I said, Windows 10 launch day today. Um, if you've got a Windows 7 or Windows 8 machine that's fully licensed, you should have a little button that tells you you can upgrade for free. I've been using it since January. Pretty good experience. Worth having a look if you've got an older PC as well. It performs really well, actually, than um, Windows 7 even on an older PC, assuming you've got driver support um, for your hardware, that is. Um, so I recommend having a look for that. And we'll talk a little bit about um, Windows 10 um, before Troy gets on, um, just because it does have some relevance to uh, as you are particularly in the enterprise um, with the vision that Microsoft has. So as always, Pizza and B, you've got that. What's new in Azure since we last got together last month? Um, I put TLDR, basically uh, it's North American summer at the moment, so it's been pretty quiet out of Redmond. There has been some updates, but um, not sort of in the mad rush there was pre-May when we had both Build and uh, Ignite in the US. Uh, and then we're going to have Troy um, step up and, and uh, talk this evening to us about a range of different topics. So um, what's in preview in Azure since we last got together? Um, so mobile engagement service. So um, Microsoft bought a, a business called um, Captain with a double P uh, in the cool kids naming market. Um, and their specialization is in doing mobile application engagement analytics. So when you build a mobile application, it allows you to track usage uh, of that application. Uh, and it's really part of the whole um, uh, App Insights type of um, features that Microsoft's trying to drive through its whole experience in this space. So they've now released a Cordova plugin. For those of you who don't know, Cordova is one of the more popular uh, mobile application development frameworks slash IDE development environments that's out there. Um, mostly uh, it's uh, popular because it's one of the open source slash free offerings that are in the marketplace. So we've seen Microsoft continue that journey into actively supporting uh, open source communities through either delivering plugins or contributing directly into the uh, application itself. Uh, the other thing that was in preview this month was Redis Cache. So Redis Cache has been about for a while inside of uh, Azure. It was GA um, late last year. What they've done now is they've actually added some additional capabilities around managing it, uh, allowing it to scale. So until now, if you wanted to scale Redis, it was very much a, an IaaS type experience where you needed to figure out how many nodes you wanted you didn't have the capability to auto scale on demand and all those sorts of things. Um, so I will put these slides up later if you want to. If you want to grab them, they'll be on the Meetup site. Um, so you having to. Sorry. sorry. Excuse that, me. That's right. Redis. Redis is a cache, so um, it's a. It can be a persistent, but it's generally in, uh, used as a non-persistent caching tier. So I can read contents out and stuff it in there. Um, uh, those people who use um, out of out of prop um, caching in say SQL Server, mm -hmm. so they're much better tuned sys, uh, solution and it's open source as well. So Redis is a, a well-known open source um, caching uh, solution. Uh, generally available. So with the shipment of uh, Visual Studio 2015 um, on the 20th, um, Application Insights, which I was just talking about, the SDK for that hit 1.0 and it now ships with Visual Studio 2015. 
So App Insights is about um, allowing you to bake telemetry into your applications when you ship them, and then leveraging the back-end power of Azure to basically capture and analyze those analytics. Um, a lot of the work that's going on in Windows 10 around tweaking and tuning user experience is being driven by telemetry being generated automatically by the system, and that's the goal of Application Insights, which is to allow you to do that uh, in your own applications. Uh, Azure Batch is now GA. So Azure Batch is a, pro se uh, a service which allows you to um, effectively rip and replace traditional batch processing environments. Um, it allows you to write jobs that run on a, a regular scheduled um, uh, basis and allows you to um, run them at scale. So if you have a large end of month processing job, you can use Azure Batch to actually schedule and execute that job and then actually push it out to a range of machines uh, in your Azure Batch environment. Um, so that, that's a bit of a, an interesting use case. There seems to be a bit of an overlap um, at first glance between Azure Scheduler, Azure Batch, um, and Azure Web Jobs. Um, they're actually aimed at slightly different things, and Batch is at a much larger enterprise scale where you can take uh, one piece of work and farm it out to a range of machines, whereas Scheduler is really, I just want to maybe run one thing, cause something to happen at one point in time, uh, and then move on, whereas Batch is a much, much bigger batch processing framework uh, solution delivered inside of Azure. Uh, Azure Site Recovery uh, is now GA, so you've got the ability to run um, backups against virtual machines running on VMware or Hyper-V and uh, physical machines as well, so it allows you to actually ship uh, machine images up into Azure uh, using uh, ASR. Um, I believe there is some support coming for AWS uh, in that, but I don't think it's part of the solution that's actually rolled out at the moment. Um, Azure Site Recovery forms part of the migration framework that Microsoft uses to help people move out of their data centers into the cloud. Uh, it is obviously predicated on the fact that you have a big enough pipe to push all that data to the cloud in the first place. It doesn't solve that problem for you. Um, RDMA access, um, or sorry, RDMA memory access on Linux. The reason that's important is the DS series machines that shipped last year had uh, high speed RAM access inside them. It's been able to be leveraged by Windows instances today hasn't been possible on Linux. With the introduction of um, SUSE Linux support, you can now run HPC clusters that leverage Linux nodes if you want as well. So RDMA access is, memory access is really about being able to run uh, high performance compute jobs at scale. Um, that access to that memory in the VM space allows you to be much more performant um, than you are without it. Uh, Document DB, which is NoSQL for out of Microsoft, um, they're keeping iterating on that solution. Uh, a lot of the earlier stuff that was done on Document DB, you had to work around limitations uh, with things such as order by um, and uh, the, some of the more advanced things that we would get out of SQL. Um, with this release, they've now got the ability to run an order by clause for the results you get back out of um, Document DB. It's a bit of an interesting one because it's no SQL, yet it's introducing SQL constructs over the top of that. Um, I'm sure Grant, sure Grant has his own perspective on that. Um, and then the last one, so this only just dropped this week, which is premium encoding um, on Azure Media Services. So you can now ingest and process uh, 4K streams uh, on Azure Media Services. Um, I'm not sure how many people are doing that for their business, but it's there if you want to use it. Um, announcements, uh, Visual Studio 2015 shipped, and along with it came the Azure SDK 2.7. So uh, definitely worth upgrading if you're using any of the earlier versions. Um, there's also in Visual Studio 2015 uh, a new uh, widget to uh, explore your cloud environments, uh, wonderfully enough called Cloud Explorer. Uh, worth going and having a play with that and see what uh, your experiences are. The old management experience inside Visual Studio um, prior to 2015 was a bit clunky. Didn't give you full access to all of the sorts of um, options and systems you have deployed into uh, your Azure environment. Cloud Explorer is much better at doing that, so worth going and having a play with that if you haven't already. Um, if you want to do that and you're not licensed for Visual Studio, uh, maybe go and have a look at the Visual Studio Community Edition, which you can use for free for non-commercial purposes. So if you want to do some hacking at home, you can go and download that for free. Uh, and then just uh, last week on Thursday, uh, Azure Search, um, which is a search as a service offering, um, is now available in Australia East. Uh, interestingly, not available in Australia Southeast at the moment. Um, <laughs> East, AU East seems to be getting services before um, AU Southeast, um, which is good for us because it's lower latency to us, but not so good if you're down in Victoria or you'd like to run low balanced uh, environments within Australia. 
Um, so I did say I was going to talk a little bit about Windows 10. So this is my last slide, and then maybe we'll do a quick drinks and pizza run, and then we'll get Troy up, Troy up to talk. Um, so who's heard of the Azure Active Directory domain join features in Windows 10? OK, one person. All right, cool. So um, part of um, Windows 10 in the enterprise, the goal with Microsoft is delivering with um, Azure AD uh, is to allow you to effectively move a lot of the traditional domain management features that you've got today in Azure, uh, sorry, in Active Directory on-prem and move some of those out into the cloud. The longer term direction on that is a bit unclear at the moment, but the goal is through uh, taking Windows 10 machines and joining them to Azure Active Directory. Um, they're effectively known on-prem in your Active Directory environment if you're doing a directory synchronization from your Active Directory to Azure Active Directory. Um, by doing Windows 10 um, Azure AD domain join, you get SSO out of the box to um, apps that support it. So if you've got apps registered um, in your Azure AD environment that support SSO, you can log into Windows 10 and then because it's domain joined to Azure Active Directory, it will do the SSO for you into other environments. Um, On-prem, because your domain joined to Azure AD, which is synced from your on-prem AD environment, it works backwards and it can figure out that your Azure AD domain join account maps to an on-prem account and then do all the traditional um, AD-based um, authentication schemes that it would for you. Not available in Pro or Home, but Enterprise, um, that's where that space is, uh, is, is headed. We're seeing a little bit of traction of that at Cloud with our customers at the moment, but it's very early days and because Windows 10 only just shipped today, um, no one's using that in anger just yet. Um, the whole goal with um, this and Intune is that eventually you'll be able to do device-based management in the enterprise without having to have a lot of on-prem kit. It'll all be SaaS-based, cloud-based. Um, so we'll see where that goes. So I thought that was interesting to talk about because um, people won't have seen that yet. We've been using it on and off inside of cloud. We don't have any on-prem kit at all. Um, so uh, it's been useful for us to use that and Intune to manage uh, our fleet of consultant devices. Uh, Andy's nodding his head there because he gets the fun of living living with an Intune managed device. Hooray. Yeah, hooray. <laughs> yep. Yep. So as your active directory domain join is not a replacement for traditional long prem AD. You still need to have a traditional long prem AD to do all the traditional on prem AD stuff you used to do like control access to file shares, control access to print servers those sorts of things, you still need that. Whether that will be the case in five years, who knows, but um, Azure AD um, is going very heavy in that space. Um, we'll see where they go in that. So um, I know a lot, but I'm not allowed to talk about it, unfortunately. Um, but it's definitely worth having a look at longer term. All right, so I'm done with um, my bit. Does anyone have any questions? Because I tend to ramble. No? Everyone just wants pizza and drinks and Troy? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <yeah>. You dessert. <laughs> um, so please feel free to grab some more pizza. I think there's a few extra boxes if those ones are empty. There's more drinks in the fridge. Let's take a, a couple of minutes just to do that, and then we'll get Troy uh, up to tick it off. <laughs> Uh, you can if you want to find it. Yeah, you know the app. Yeah, yeah. Yeah,
So we're, we should stop. That, that's the webcam. So, so are there still zero? No, we've got three. Oh man, now I can't see it. All right. So um, when I was talking to Simon about what we're going to do today, and I'm not going to stay in front of the webcam just for everybody who's there. Sorry, I thought I about it. We um, we said, yeah, look, we'll just just mix it up. We'll do a bit of a bunch of stuff. So I've got um, I've got uh, nine bullet points, and then the rest <laughs> will just basically work out. So hello, take this. Sorry, who are you? <laughs> yeah, no, go see. Uh, so who here is a developer? Who's, who's not a developer? What, what do you guys do for developers? Infrastructure. Infrastructure. Okay. I'm Anyone else? Infrastructure. Is, isn't infrastructure on the cloud now? Yeah. <laughs> Someone's got to run the cloud. Uh, okay, so of, of the developers, who works in ASP.NET? Who works in lots of things? <laughs> no one. No, no, no. All right. So we'll make it pretty technology technology agnostic today. We will have a um, little bit of infrastructure stuff as well, and I'll just kind of mix up different things. And really, there's you know, like I said, there's no set agenda. So ask me questions and things. So it's more fun when everybody sort of gets a bit more involved. Anyway. Uh, so I thought we might start with um, maybe we'll do some cross site scripting. So who's who's heard of cross site scripting? XSS, you know how it is. Who uh, who stays up at night worried about XSS? You should. You should. <laughs> Let's have a look. So what we'll do is I'll go through and I'll do a bunch of demos and things. Uh, and a lot of these, what you say, these, these. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of these will be a bit ad hoc as well. So what I've got to do, um, first of all, there is a website called uh, hackyourselffirst.troyhunt.com. Now, anyone can go there and start hacking away at stuff. And in fact, after this as well, I'm going to give everyone a free Pluralsight pass because this is from one of my Pluralsight courses called Hack Yourself First. And this is one of the places you can go onto the internet and break stuff without people then knocking on your door asking why you're breaking stuff because it's designed to do it. And all of this is hosted on Azure and it's designed to be fundamentally insecure. Now, one of the things is because it's so insecure, people keep breaking it on there, which is kind of what it's intended to do. But you never know when someone's going to break it in unfortunate ways. And in fact, I can see that someone has changed my name to Troy One for some reason. So just while I, I rebuild this, I'll tell you the sort of stuff that happens. So I did, uh, last year, I did the DDD Melbourne show, which was really good. And I had a workshop for a couple of hours where I talked, uh, taught everyone about uh, things like SQL injection. And we'll do SQL injection on this in a moment too. And then I, I was doing the lock note at the end of the day, and everyone was there in the auditorium. And I normally get someone to come up and do an exercise. We'll do this later as well. And I'm saying to this this lady who came up, you know, click on the thing on the screen that you like. And what I hadn't realised, this is sort of a site that lists all these supercars. Someone had changed the name of every single car to penis. And I was saying, <laughs> click on the one, and there's all these people laughing, and they're like, what's the number? Uh, so that is now rebuilt, and hopefully I'm now. What's your name? No. You've, it's like you've put the worst desk for the tallest guy. Sorry, I suffer as well, and I'm sure, right? Oh, thanks, mate. So I'm just going to clear all my cookies out of the browser. Uh, so can, this I ask, can I ask a question? You said, I'm going to rebuild this. What, what did you actually do? So this is, uh, this is an entity framework code first implementation of ASP.NET running on Azure. So what I did is I just called into the function which effectively blitzes the database and recreates everything. Because they're SQL injection flaws, and we'll see how bad they can be in a moment, uh, people can unfortunately change the data. Or fortunately, but that's kind of what things do. Yep. So that just uh, blitzed it, and it's all reset. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to log back in, and we'll log in with my account. There's about 50 different vulnerabilities on this site as well. Uh, so there's lots of stuff to, to kind of keep you amused. So I'm now logged in, and this is all going to be a bit hot ad hoc, so I'm just going to grab some stuff from from my presentations, and I'll grab one of my demos. Look at this in NBC, didn't I? Uh, we'll get an XSS attack here. So let me explain what's going to happen with XSS. So many websites will reflect data back to the user. What I mean by that is, if we go and do something like if we search for Ferrari, like so. It will come back and it will say, you searched for Ferrari, because this is all very nice and user-friendly. You get this feedback. And in fact, you can see Ferrari in the URL. It's passed in the cruise street. 
So this is reflecting. We give the website something and it comes back and it reflects that information in the response. And the question then becomes, what could we possibly give the website to cause it to reflect back that might be able to do something malicious? So I'll jump to sort of the conclusion of that and then we'll talk about the mechanics. So if I was to go, and I'll just check what that string was, like that, if I was to do something like this, that is an XSS attack that's just stolen all my cookies. So let me explain how this works. What we would do with an XSS attack is we would try and socialize a URL like this. So someone would go, hey, grab this big URL and we'll break it down and figure out what's happening on there. And then put it on Twitter or send it via email or get someone to follow this link. And then when the link follows, it's going to put some JavaScript on the page which does something. And what this has actually done is it's put an image over here, we can see it's a broken image. The font is a little bit large. And the source of that image is attacker.com, and then there's a query string that passes all the cookies. And what's actually happening is it's passing off the auth cookie. So it's effectively giving the attacker the thing that is passed on every request in order to identify the user. So if an attacker has that cookie, they can go and recreate it in another browser and effectively become me. Now let's have a look at what's actually happened. So when I went to this URL, in the source code of this page, it jumps down to the end of the page there, it's actually written this string. Make that a little bit larger. So what's happening here in the string is it's passing content which closes off a piece of JavaScript. So I've got a single quote, close bracket, semicolon, right, that's closed declares a variable called image, uh, it creates an image on the page, it sets the source of the image at attacker.com or wherever the attacker lives, and then it passes a query string called cookies and it appends document.cookie, which is every single cookie that the browser has access to, and then it embeds that image in the page, so it renders it into the page by the DOM. So if I can get someone to follow the URL up there, it will cause this to be rendered into the source code, and it will send the cookies to the attacker. Now, I'll talk about how to stop this from happening in a moment, but has anyone got any questions about this bit? Some people are a little bit puzzled, some people are going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The more about it, just, yeah. Yes, so that's part of the answer. So let's jump into that. So here's one of the issues. When we go over and we hit F12 to go into our developer tools, and we go into our resources, and we go into our cookies, and we have a look at all the cookies here, and we zoom in a little bit on that guy, we'll see that we've got this HTTP column. So who knows what an HTTP only cookie is? Alright, cool. Most people don't. You should watch these courses. <laughs> so, what an HTTP only cookie does is cookies can be read by the client and they can be read by the server. So you can read them by JavaScript in the browser and you can read them by server-side code. So they get sent in every request that goes to the server. Now that works really well in some cases where you want the client to be able to read the cookies, but in other cases you don't want the client to be able to read the cookies. So let's talk about this auth cookie for a little bit more. So we've got this cookie here, auth cookie. It's a great big long cryptographically strong value. If I hover over that, you get a bit of a stretch that out. It goes on and on and on. It can be quite long. It is cryptographically strong, so you shouldn't be able to just recreate it. Now the auth cookie is the thing that we need to keep secure because that identifies the user. If an attacker has that cookie, they can just go and put it in another browser and then they're me. Now the thing about the auth cookie is the client doesn't do anything with it, so JavaScript doesn't read it. And in fact, there's probably not a lot of cases these days where you use JavaScript in cookies, particularly now we've got HTML5 and we've got local storage and things like that. So the thing is, if we can make this cookie HTTP only, and you'll see the cookie above it is actually HTTP only. If we could make the auth cookie HTTP only, then the browser couldn't access it. So even if we could get script to run on the site, the script wouldn't be able to access the auth cookie. Does that help answer the question, or I mean, it was more of a statement <laughs> about HTTP only. Are there any questions about why we would have an HTTP only cookie? Make sense? Yeah. What does it mean that it's HTTP only? HTTP only, and it, it, to be honest, it's kind of a crappy word because it should be something like cannot be accessed by the browser. You know, but it means that you, you can't access, access it by the browser. 
So if I was to, let's forget about XSS and everything, if I was just to jump into JavaScript and say alert document.cookie, you would not see anything that displayed as HTTP only. Now what that means is because the client can't access the cookie, you can't use attacks on the client side like cross-site scripting in order to retrieve the cookie. You can only retrieve it from the server side. So just to maybe fill in some gaps on what I'm spinning through there, if you were to go and say, let's just take a new tab. Okay, 12, we'll go to our network, we'll reload the page. Every single time we make a request for this domain, any cookies that are valid for the domain are going to be sent. So that's why we're seeing the cookies being sent. So this is how we do persistence over HTTP, which is a stateless protocol. And what I mean by that is every time you make a request over HTTP, it's a new request. It's not one single open connection. So how does the server know who you are after you've authenticated? It sends back this great big freaking auth cookie every single time. So we need the auth cookie because that's the thing that keeps us identified and keeps us logged in. But we need to make it an HTTP only cookie, unlike the one that is currently here, because otherwise, if there is a risk, like a cross-site scripting attack, it gets stolen. Now, the other thing that this raises is, should you really be able to enter anything that you want, say, into a search box, and then have it rendered into the HTML source? So I'll, I'll ask this in a, as a question. If you wanted to, uh, let's imagine I searched for, actually, I can't search that because it'll block it. Let's just imagine I searched for uh, a phrase, and I put an EM tag around it, because I wanted to turn it into italics. Now, if I search for that, how do we make it appear with EM tags actually in the browser? So who knows how we would do that? HTML encoding. Right, so HTML encoding. So our angle brackets would become ampersand less than semicolon for the left one, and then ampersand GT for the right one. So that's HTML encoding. So we would take that input string, and we'd say before we write it into the source code, we're going to encode it. Now, if you're, most people here who said they were developers were ASP.NET, so for example, if you use uh, MVC and you use Razor syntax, every single time you take any value, whether it just be a variable or an attribute on a model or anything like that, you write into the page, it will automatically output in code for the HTML context. Now, the HTML context is important, so since you gave me an answer for that, let's see if you know this one. If you were to write that into JavaScript, how would you encode it? HTML string, right, so the encoding is different, right? Because it wouldn't be ampersand, lt, semicolon. And I don't know exactly what it is, because all the JavaScript encoding is really weird, and it's got x's and backslashes and things like that. But the point is, is that you encode differently for different contexts. So one of the things that really needs to happen here, is that if we jump back to the source code, when this gets rendered down here, and by the way, this is the stupidest JavaScript ever. Never do this. <laughs> like, it's just entirely pointless. Um, this should be encoded for the JavaScript context. So what we just searched for should not appear like that. It should actually be encoded such that it actually renders into that search term value on the text box. So you've got to encode correctly for the right context. And one thing that people get wrong is they say, oh, I'm using MVC, and MVC does automatic output encoding, so I'll just use my Razor syntax and just drop that wherever I want. But the encoding for JavaScript is different than it is for HTML. And it's different for CSS, and it's different for LDAP. It's different for HTML attributes than what it is for HTML tags. So context really matters. I'm going to jump onto something else in a minute. Any, any XSS questions? Oh, 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 there, that's embarrassing. Um, so Simon says, apparently I had this on my own website. And I, I, I did, but it's not my fault. <laughs> so let's, um, let's qualify that, because I wrote a blog post on it, um, which was very recent, which was how I got XSS to buy my ad network. Uh, now, a, a, a friend of mine, another MVP in developer security, sent me an email, and he said, oh, I just XSS to Bob. So yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> That's very nice of you. But what he was saying, and it, it, it goes on a little bit about the mechanics of it, but because I have ads on the blog, when you put ads on your blog, 
you generally put them inside an iframe and it loads content from the ad provider. And ads, everyone knows this already, but it's kind of like a shady world. Even the good ads are a shady world. And I have, theoretically, the good ads because they're developer-centric ads from a reputable ad network. But basically, what was happening is that one of the ad networks that was being used, it was only one of them, so it was like I couldn't reproduce it. One guy could do it every you know, 100 page loads or something. But one of the ad networks was taking something from the referrer string in the request header and just writing it directly into the page so that if you could actually change the URL that mm -hmm. you were hitting, so if you went to troyhunt.com, question mark, my XSS, it would take that and it would render it to the page and he could get alert boxes to pop up, he could redirect the entire page, he could do any of this sort of stuff on my blog, which really wasn't my fault. But um, did I mention that? <laughs> but it was interesting actually how the ad network responded. They were really good. They um, they pulled the, the, the provider straight away and then the provider that did have the problem fixed things straight away. Uh, and interestingly, the, um, the domain they were serving it from was it? It was something like AdSafeSecure, AdSafeSecure.com, and it turns out that just loading something over a domain called AdSafeSecure doesn't actually make it safe or secure. So if anyone wasn't aware of that already, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it's like those little bitmap uh, padlocks on the page. No, they don't, they don't work. They don't do All right, let's um, let's jump on to something. Yeah, sorry, go. Uh, what happens if it's SSL? Your site is SSL. Uh, so you are screwed securely if it's SSL. Uh, so basically, so the question is, what happens if it's SSL? So we, we got to look at what what SSL or TLS or HTTPS, and, and they're all different things, but we use the terms in the same way. What it does, and really, it, it gives us three things. So it gives us uh, confidentiality. So an attacker somewhere in the middle of the communication cannot see the contents of the message. It gives us integrity. So an attacker cannot change the message. And it gives us authenticity, so we know who we're speaking to because that server has to serve the certificate that then gets validated. So it, it gives us security between the two points. It doesn't stop you making a request over HTTPS, which then has a malicious payload in it. And in fact, just to make that really, really clear, we can load this over HTTPS, like so, and we'll still have the same attack there. 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 Because all we're doing is we're passing information in the request, and we're just passing it over a secure connection. And, and I was joking, saying it just means it's screwed securely, but it's kind of true because what happens is that this request goes over an HTTPS connection, and the response comes back over HTTPS. So you can't view it, modify it, or change the route that it takes, but it's still XSS. It's just like you can still have SQL injection over HTTPS. So you can still do all of these nasty things over HTTPS. <laughs> Probably makes sense because I have a <coughs> web app on HTTPS, and then I log in with my password. Yeah. Then my client, when they try to log in, could I see my user ID and my password. Mm. Actually, this, this is a good question, and a lot of people raise this. So I do a I do a workshop that runs over one or two days, and one of the things we do is we do a lot of HTTPS stuff. And one of the interesting things is we, we spend a lot of time looking at the dev tools, and I'll show you what people say to me, because I think this is what you're saying. And tell me if you get this wrong. I'm going to uh, log out here, and then I'm going to go to the login page, I'm going to open up the network tab, and clear all those, I'm going to log in again, now I've logged in, and I'm going to go back and look at this network request, we'll look at the first one, and we will look at the request, and we'll look at the form data, and we can see my password there. Now, is that what your is that your question? Like, okay, so my client has no access to my computer at all. Yeah, remotely located, and then when you try to log it to the app, and you can see my username, my password. Okay, so let's. Uh, I'll explain this, and then you can tell me if it actually answers your question. Because I'm not convinced it does. But just to be clear, when we logged on, we actually made an HTTPS request. So this was sent over the wire securely. Mm -hmm. And what I often hear people saying, and again, I don't know if it's exactly what you're saying, but let me go through it anyway, is people saying, this is HTTPS. How yep. come I can see That's right. the email? So does anyone know why? Because it's, it's on my browser. It's in my DOM, 
right? So this is this is before it gets encrypted and goes over the wire. So we're basically looking at things that are on my machine. If you were anywhere outside of this machine on, on the wires, because we're wireless, or if cloud's capturing all my traffic or anything like that, you wouldn't be able to see it. You wouldn't be able to see it until it gets to, in this case Azure, until it gets to Azure's SSL devices in front of the website service and gets decrypted behind that. So you can see things that you enter in your own environment before it gets down there. Not from another No, correct. If, if you can, you've got a bigger problem. <laughs> it shouldn't do that. That's all you're going to have to do. I haven't ever seen it before. All right, so have a think about it like that, and, and uh, again, not to keep pimping the courses as well, but I sort of explained that there, at what point things get encrypted. Hey, yep. Sorry, just before you go, I have a question. Sure. So you mentioned back on the topic before about the security <coughs> and how some uh, have an attribute that's not a main client to see them. Cookies, yep. Sorry, cookies, yep. Well, seeing them in the client, that can you explain how XWorld is built? Yeah, so and I, I'm, I'll show you what I, I think you're asking, which is you're saying, how is it that in the developer tools I can see these cookies even though they're flagged as HTTP only, or that, that particular one? So we've got to remember what this does. And, and in fact, there's two attributes here. Let's talk about HTTP and secure. Does everyone know what the secure attribute does on cookies? Anyone? Maybe send You've got a beard. Are you a security guy? Because <laughs> 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 you're getting a lot of these right. So um, both HTTP only and secure are attributes of a cookie. Now, when you create a cookie in your framework of choice, you can normally specify whether they're HTTP only or whether they're secure or, or, or both. Uh, so, for example, if you're an ASP.NET and you create a new cookie, you can set those, those attributes uh, programmatically. You can also set them in your web.config to ensure that uh, all cookies, all HTTP cookies are secure and or HTTP only. And these are attributes of the cookie that follow the cookie around wherever it goes. So when you first log in, for example, and you get this auth token, it stands in the cookie and it has these attributes and your browser maintains it. Now the thing is, both HTTP only and secure are really browser controls. So the browser looks at these and says, OK, this is what I can and cannot do. So for HTTP only, the browser says, if you run JavaScript in me, I will not give you this cookie. To secure, it says, if you make a request to the domain, which the cookie is otherwise valid for, but it's not HTTP, so I'm not going to send it. So the browser puts the control on, and it's the browser that won't let you send it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So you can still see it, but I couldn't write JavaScript to access this. But that is actually a really, really good segue to the next thing I want to talk about. And I want to sort of give you a, a give you a demo here. So I'm just going to pull one of my talks here. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about XSS, but this will lead into something else interesting. Um, so this is a talk I did a few weeks ago in Norway, and there was a bit here. Where was it? That's kind of interesting. Because a lot of people go, oh, you know, XSS is it really kind of such a serious risk. And this is Dutch banks with XSS attacks. So this is reflected XSS. So someone has got the URL that if anyone else follows it, it gets the bank to do this. <laughs> so this is cool, right? Like getting your bank to do the Harlem Shake. Who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> this, the significance of it is that someone has got an arbitrary script to run, and it's, it's really hard to see that URL because it's like a heavily encoded video then on a little screen. But you can just get a bit of a sense that there's sort of a, a JavaScript eval and other things off the end of it. So if anyone sees this URL, the bank can do the Harlem Shake. And someone did this to make the point that we have a lot of financial institutions who should be the bastions of good security, right? Mm -hmm. Who are doing this wrong. Now, we can do our own Harlem Shake with lots of other resources. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. So I'm going to go and grab a little bit of script here. And we'll talk about what this does later. No one read all that, did they? Um, 
You know what? Because Simon keeps talking, let's see if we can do this to cloud. This might be interesting. Uh, uh, <laughs> Let us see what happens. And I, I haven't tested this, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. We're going to jump into the console. We're going to paste this and load it. Ooh, that's interesting. Something there broke. Did I copy all of it? Otherwise, we will just go to a bank. Ah, oh. no, 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 no! Don't get excited! Don't get excited! That's not the right script. <laughs> that was my attack script. Oh, thanks, it says cookies. I have way too many things here. Maybe it was Jamie. Which was the other half? Thank you. I hope you're paying attention. I told you it wasn't. Ah. Uh... Oh. <laughs> Now that's a problem. Uh, I was ready for that question. Alright, so, so let, let's talk through that because someone has spotted my ninja trick and <laughs> that, that caught me out. And what you have said, and correct me if I've misunderstood, is that all I did was I actually put this into the console and executed it. Therefore, I am cheating, and there is actually nothing wrong with cloud. Did I get that right? I'd like to know more. Yeah, kind of inject something into the page itself, just your console. So, so well, this is actually a good question, right? So, our website to do the hard and shake in this way. No, no one is very decisive because you're all thinking it doesn't matter, but no one wants to say because you then know I'm going to tell you you're wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the user doesn't see that. The user thinks they've gone to that site, right? It's the same way that you've got XSS, which you can get someone to follow a link. You can get someone to follow a disingenuous link that contains something along those lines. You can inject something to the site and do something with it. Yeah, but I haven't exploited an XSS risk here either. I've just mucked around with the site of my DOM. I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's go to one of my sites. We'll see if we can do it. So I run this site called Have I Been Pwned, which sits up there on Azure and serves many, many hundreds of millions of, of records that people can search for to see if they have appeared in a data breach somewhere. And if Azure wakes up and serves it, you will see it in just a moment. There we go. Now let's try this here. And let's see if it works on my site. No dancing, Simon. I don't hear dancing. I don't hear singing. Now, there are some interesting things here in the console that explain why this doesn't work. In fact, there's two errors here in the console. So one says, refuse to load the style sheet. And then there's an Amazon AWS address. Uh, and then it says, because it violates the following content security policy. So who knows what a content security policy is? Couple? Security guy does. Uh, <laughs> so a, a content security policy or a CSP is a browser response server. And it's, it's really interesting actually because very few people are familiar with these. They're, they're kind of new but they are supported by, uh, by every current generation of the browser. We can say current generation for Edge now, can't we, as of today? So it's good news. So here's what happens with a CSP. When we look at XSS risks, so when we look at the one that I just did, when we look at all the Dutch banks, Many of them work by exploiting the site after it already loads in the client. So the website has loaded, but because you have passed a malicious query string and then that query string is rendered in, somewhere on the client you're modifying it and you're getting it to do, say, load in external content. So that Harlem shake works because it loads in a style sheet and it loads in some audio. And what a content security policy does is it tells the browser what it is allowed to load. And it does that with a whitelist. So it says you can load style sheets from here and there, you can load media from there, you can load fonts from there, and if it doesn't match the whitelist, it doesn't load and you get these errors. So let me show you how that works. So if we jump over to our network tab here, and I go back to the get request for the page, and I scroll down a little bit, and all of that is actually cached. Uh, actually, this is the one I want. That was an internal redirect. We'll get to those. Um, that one is moved permanently. This is the one I want. Where's my response header? Response, response, response. Here we go. Content security policy. Now, 
I'm going to show you how to actually view this in a readable way in a moment as well. But this is what a CSP is. So a CSP is just a response header with text. There is no magic for a CSP. The browser knows how to parse that response <coughs> header and do some sensible things with it. Now, I'll show you a way to actually read this in a fashion that doesn't look entirely terrible like this. We can go to, what is it, report URI, or was it, um, I don't remember which site it is. Ah, no, security headers. Security headers at IO. That's the one. We can go to security headers to IO. No, no, it was report URI. They're two different things from the same guide, but they're very similar things. We can go to report URI.io forward slash home forward slash analyze. This is made by a guy in the UK called Scott Helm who does some really interesting stuff with security headers. And what you can do is you can plug in your URL and say analyze. And it will go away and analyze, and it will come back, and it will tell you what your CSP is set to do. So in this case, what it's saying is default sources. And have a look at the things you can control. You can control child sources, like frames. You can control uh, fonts, images, uh, objects, um, if you still need splash, <laughs> things like that. Style sources, media, all sorts of things. I said self. So we can load all of these from ourselves. You are allowed to load an image onto a web page from the same domain. And then we get really specific, so we get into script sources. You say, this website is allowed to load scripts from self. It is allowed to run unsafe inline scripts. Does everyone know what an unsafe inline script is? So who, who's ever had an HTML page and they've gone, yeah, I'll just back some JavaScript in the page. Script, script, angle brackets, braces, all the usual kind of JavaScript -y stuff. The CSP is explicitly saying I'm going to allow that to run. So what you can actually do is you can say I don't want to allow that to run because really is it is it a clean pattern to have JavaScript written into your HTML or should you have it in an external JS file where it's more maintainable and all these things. The security relevance is pretty much what we just saw with the XSS attack where I had that broken image appear because writing script into the page is a really popular means of rounding an XSS attack. So, Unsafe inline, I actually allow, and I'll explain why I allow at the moment. Unsafe eval, I allow. So you know the eval function within JavaScript where you say eval and then you just throw a string into it and it just goes, yeah, we'll just do whatever you want. I allow that. You can turn that off. And again, I'll explain why in a moment. I also allow scripts to be loaded from google.com and googleanalytics.com for probably obvious reasons. I allow them from Cloudflare because I use the CDN on Cloudflare, so all my jQuery and everything gets loaded from Cloudflare, so I have to allow the browser to pull that data back, and I use New Relic and a few other things. And then it just keeps going, right? So there's our scripts, styles, <coughs> images, frames. Actually, this is a good example, because I'll use this to explain how you do this. You basically just go through and you say, these are all the things that I want to allow. Now, a little while ago, after I'd implemented the CSP, I decided to put some reports, uh, in fact, some real-time stats on this site. So I use New Relic, and what I wanted to do was put a status page on here, which has New Relic graphs of all the requests that are going through to the site. So you can look at it and go, okay, there's at the moment there's 6,000 requests a minute, and something like that. But I wanted to be able to put them there. And when I first did this, it was after I'd implemented the CSPs, I did this and it didn't work. And you know how like something doesn't work and you're banging your head against the table going, why the hell doesn't it work? Without any idea what's going on, what was happening was that this was getting blocked by the CSP because I didn't have this CSP, the one that says I am allowed to populate frames from New Relic. So you see how you have to be explicit about everything that you want to allow. So what I normally do if I'm going to build a CSP is to kind of start from a blank slate where I say, okay, I'm going to return a CSP header, and I'm not going to allow anything. And basically, the page loads the stuff from its own site, and everything else just entirely specs out. It just goes nuts. So it doesn't load in Bootstrap from Cloudflare. It doesn't load in the images from my CDN. It doesn't do any of these sort of things. But the console tells you, because the console does exactly what we saw it do just before when we put in that column shape. It will tell you all the things that are actually wrong with it. And I've got to copy the whole thing again. Yeah, back to there. 
it gives you those messages, refuse to load this, refuse to that. So you can sort of go through and basically start whitelisting things bit by bit. Now the reason why I'm allowing things which with the benefit of hindsight I would not allow, so things like this, is because I wanted to just take the site as it stood and say let's put the CSP in and not modify the site. So let's make the CSP support the site as it is. If someone can find another XSS attack or something later on, they're not going to be able to do stuff like full script from other sources, but I just want the site to work. And I already had unsafe inline script, and I already had unsafe email. And it was a code smell, and I'm really sorry, I shouldn't have done it, but it was there. Same with style sheets. I had unsafe inline CSS, so I had a style attribute on some of my tags. Only a couple of them, I might need to go in and remove them now that I want to sort of strengthen this a bit. But they were there. Now here's, here's something else interesting. If I go to my network tab, so we had these two exceptions, right? And we go to my network tab, and then right down the bottom, actually it's right at the top because I refreshed my network, we can see two requests here to webresource.axd. And what I'll do, actually, I'll jump back here. There's one other attribute here, report URI. The location the user agent should send violation reports. <clears throat> and then we've got web resource and a CSP query stream. So one of the things about CSP is when there is a violation, you can configure it so that you get a report of the violation. So what actually happened when my browser tried to load in those two resources from the Harlem Shake, for each one of those resources it made a request to webresource.axd and it passed the nature of that request. So if I go down and have a look at the request payload, here's a CSP report. And then I log all of this to table storage in Azure and I can go back and I can see every single time someone tried to load something into my website. Okay, it was in their browser, but it's still my website. I see every time someone tried to load that stuff in. So that's a real yep. So why why should we care? Because it's like one it's your own case, right, on the users and check. So what they paste in there is up to them. But then the server itself, we did the payout thing, I checked, but it didn't change. So it's only yeah. one change, one change. No, and it, wouldn't it be awesome if we could have changed the server? That, uh, we would have seen Simon run very, very quickly. <laughs> so the, the, the significance is, at the moment, and I'm, I'm going to single you out because you were so vocal earlier. Assuming you backed up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the significance <laughs> is, <laughs> <laughs> the cloud site will let you pull in resources from other locations that Simon doesn't want in there. I assume you didn't want the whole shake. No. Now, really. that in itself is not an exploitable risk. That has to be combined with something. But let's say he did have reflected XSS, where we could construct a URL that actually pulled in the resources from the Harlem Shake and played or did something more nefarious. Then we would have a problem. Now, if we put a CSP in place which says you can only pull in resources, say, from your own domain and, and the Cloudflare CDN, then even if he does have an XSS risk, someone's not going to be able to, to, to use an attack vector that pulls in things from other locations. So it, it is not the sole answer. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, is about this defense in depth, or the layers. It's like, let's do this and this and this and this. Because if we do all those things and one of them goes wrong or two of them goes wrong, we're not going to have a drama. So it, it is a layer of defense. It is not the only defense. Does that help answer? It does, yeah. yeah, okay. All right, so that's... Um, that's CSPs. Now, if you are working in, um, in ASP.NET, it's really, really easy to add CSPs with a NuGet package called nwebsec. So you go and you get nwebsec out of NuGet, and you can go through in a very sort of convention-based manner in your web.config and just declare everything that you want to allow in your CSP. So it actually makes it really, really easy because this, honestly, like when you look at the actual CSP that I have, it looks like a mess. And although it's just text and it's just a response header, like this is a bunch of stuff that you've got to put in that looks kind of kind of nasty. So using something like nwebsec makes it a lot easier. Um, last thing on this as well, if, if you're interested in a content security policy, there is an option to report only and not block. So what that means is, is that you can try and get your CSP right and then put it out there but if you didn't get it right and one of your pages has an obscure embedded image from another location, it won't break it. It will send a report back to whatever you set your report URI to be 
so that you can then have a look at it. You know, maybe you just let it run for a week, and then you're okay. Well, let's have a look at the reports. Let's see if our policy at the moment is breaking stuff. Now, this also, in some ways, is a little bit like that HTTP only cookie, the secure cookie, in that this is a browser control. So the website has responded to the browser. The browser said, okay, this is what I'm allowed to do. So if someone tries to get the browser to do something it's not meant to do, that's when it will fail. So the browser has to support it. And just for the reference, can I use CSP? If we have a look at CSP, oops, the one. Let's just go to the can I use site. Can I use.com? CSP. So CSP support again is pretty good. Except for IE, the edge is okay. But if you send and I'll, sorry, we'll get there. <laughs> if you send a, a CSP response header and someone's using say IE9, it just won't do anything. I'll be like, oh, there's some extra content in my response header. I don't know what to do with it, <laughs> so I'll just ignore it. Sorry, you have been waiting for ages. That's right. So if I follow correctly on your own site, you have content security policy if you're allowing unsafe in some circumstances. Yep. Have you attempted to replace those with the hashed in line? Oh, good question. Good question. You know your CSPs. Um, so there, there, is a, there is a ninja trick around CSPs, which is you can allow inline, say, inline script if you include a hash of that inline script. So we'll take a step back. We've got to remember this is the server telling the browser what it is allowed to do. And one of the things you can do is you can get the server to say, you can run inline script if you like, but only this specific inline script. It's not the whole thing. It's a hash of it, because the whole thing could obviously be quite large. So you can actually send that hash back to the client. The client can trust it. So to your point, what I could do is I could stop the ability to just run any sort of arbitrary inline script on the site, and I could say you're explicitly allowed to run this script with this hash, or I could get my arsenic again and remove my script, <laughs> which is what I probably should do. Are there any CSP questions before we go on to something else? All right, so, so that's good. That's new to most people. That's interesting. Uh, okay, so let me see. What will we do next? Um, let's do some SQL injection. So who here is familiar with SQL injection? Who here is not familiar with SQL injection? That doesn't add up. <laughs> I'm going to ask again in a moment. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to pick an example. I'm going to go to this site and we're going to pick, say, no, actually, let, let, let's do this. So, all right, we, we've got to make this add up because I saw a bunch of hands go up for who has done SQL injection. Who has never done a SQL injection take before? All right, do you want to come up here? Because we're going to need you to do one just to, just to sort of show that there is no magic involved here. What's your name? Oh, get out. Get out. <laughs> All right, so here's what we're going to do, mate. Um, what I want to do is you can drive for a little bit. I'm going to open the over here and drink my beer. Uh, and what we'll do is we can scroll down on this page just a little bit. And we've got three manufacturers there. We've got Nissan, McLaren, and Pagani. And you can pick one that you like. And I know that it's not penis. <laughs> 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 uh, OK, now. This is a fairly typical sort of pattern if you look at the URL. Uh, so there's a, there's a path here, which is actually a route from NBC, and there's a query string. And we often pass query strings around in URLs to instruct the page what to do. So let's copy this URL, because this looks like it um, could be kind of interesting. Put it on the clipboard. Now on the taskbar, there's a little carrot down on the bottom right. And that carrot is the Habitch program. So I might just get you to maximize that guy up, because we're going to see a bit of data come here. Now, there's a target field. Let's paste the URL you just copied into that target field. OK, let's uh, click the Analyze button. Now, the reason why I show this tool a lot is because it is ridiculously simplistic and trivial. I've got a video of how I taught my three-year-old to use it. Uh, that's how easy it is. I often do this at conferences where I'll get someone to come up who's never done it before to try and make the point that SQL injection can be really, really trivial. Now, what's happened when Owen clicked that Analyze button is it's just gone away and made a heap of HTTP requests. And already, it's actually found out the internal name of the database. Now, this is ASP.NET running on Azure. And there is nothing wrong with ASP.NET or Azure. 
but it has discovered the database because my application is full of holes. So it's hack yourself first underscore db. It's the name of the database. Now that's good, but we want more info. So you'll see there's a, a button called tables, sort of around the middle of the screen there. So let's click on that. And then let's click on the get tables button beneath it. Because this is what we really want, right? Like we want to get data out of the database. So this is now telling us all the tables that exist in that database. Now, Owen, it's, it's kind of up to you now, mate. What do you, what do you want to hack out of this database? I like supercar. Yeah, but it's not real. Let's get, like, no. OK. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you how to hack. <laughs> we want personal, sensitive information. You know, what kind of a hack do this are you? OK, here's a good idea. All right, so uh, well, that's the table. So what do we now want from the table? Columns? Yeah. Oh, well done. Good hacker. Nice. All right, so it's going away and it's making more and more HTTP requests. And now we're going to wait until it finds them all, but it's going to go and find every single column that is on that table. Now, this is the real database sitting behind that website. You can all go and do this yourself if you want. Uh, I think it's probably found everything. So with your uh, hacker hat on, what, what data would you grab? What else might you need from that table? <coughs> I'd be, if it was me, I'd just say I'd be grabbing email. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get the data. And there we go. Job done. All right. Okay, good question. Eh? First of all, give, uh, give Owen a hand of applause. Thank you, Owen. Well um, <laughs> be proud, man. <laughs> I'm going to answer the question about how it's done, what it's done in just a moment. If, if anyone does want to play with Havage, it, it was available for free. Um, it was always a penetration test until uh, the guys that made it took it offline a little while ago. I've got an original copy. Send me an email if you want a copy of it. There are better tools out there, quite frankly, for SQL injection, but there are a few that, is, that are impactful um, as just using GUI. Sorry, sorry just quickly, I missed it. That's the best. That's, like, that, that's the highlight of the show, man. Too bad. Yeah. Do you want to do it again? Yeah. That was it. Copy and paste. So let's run through the mechanics because you, you had a very good question, which is how does this magic-looking thing work? So here's the way we'll try and answer it. If we go back to this page here, um, again, it's it's a it's a path. It's a query string. Now, let's imagine. Um, let's imagine what we're trying to do here. Actually, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. Let's grab a window just here, and what I want to do is let's imagine we have a query which is uh, select star from product where ID equals, and then you can pass whatever you want here in a query string. So uh, we've all built apps like this. Everyone who's a developer where you've got a web page and you have a query string, and if you change the value of the query string, you get a different thing back from the database. And somewhere you have script that does something like this. Now, normally what would happen in here is that you would pass something like, say, ID equals 5. Okay? And you'd get whatever product number 5 is. If you pass 6, you get product number 6. This is good. This is the way the web works. What if I passed X instead? What would happen? No record. Would, would it get that far? But is it a syntax error? Mm -hmm. So let, let's imagine that ID is an integer. So I'll give you a hint. It, it won't say no record found, and it won't say syntax error. Who's a database developer? If it's a column there. Oh, you got all the answers. <laughs> so you're very, very close. So what it would say is that there is no column called X. Because have a think about it. If your query said that, right? So that's almost like saying, I would like my ID column to be equivalent to my X column. So it is a valid query. It won't return no records. It will fail, but it will fail, and it will say, so what would SQL Server say if you tried to run this? Like that. SQL Server would just say there's no column called X. It would have an exception. Now, there are different kinds of SQL injection, but the kind that we just used, and the one we'll talk about today, is called error-based injection. And it is predicated on the fact that you can get a database to throw errors that then appear in the URL. And it, it, sorry, in, in the web page in the response. 
Now, it would be quite useful if we could get the database to actually tell us that there is no column called X. And I'll show you why. We'll sort of do this a little bit more manually. So if we change this like that, okay, so let's have a look at what's going on here. So that's very, very similar, right? Invalid column name, supercar over the X. So what's actually happening in this case is it's just appending that query string value into the SQL statement. So the SQL statement says something like, select star from supercar ID where make equals three, because we've got that route in there, order by, and then just order by whatever the hell the query string gives us. And then what's happening is when we actually pass in an invalid column name, it's just appending it into the SQL string, and the database is saying, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, and we're actually seeing a SQL exception. So the SQL exception is coming from the database, being returned to ASP.NET, and ASP.NET then returns in response. Now, of course, this also works because I don't have custom errors turned on. So you should never be showing these internal errors publicly. But even if we weren't showing the internal errors and the query was still constructed in the same way, there are still other attacks using SQL injection. Now, here's where it sort of starts to get really interesting. So if we imagine that we're doing order by supercar ID, how, the, the question then becomes, how could we start to change this value to get the database to throw an exception or something useful in it? So just going off the top of my head, um, what if we did, and there's one of my earlier ones, what if we did something like um, select star uh, from widget? Okay, so this has actually told us that there is no table called widget. So see how the database leaks something useful. Um, we know already that there's a user profile table in there, so we'll do that as an example. What if we said select star from user profile? Okay, so now we've got a problem because we're trying to order by a collection of results, and it's saying that only one expression can be specified. So rather than having multiple columns and multiple results, what if we just make it one column and we'll make that one column foo. Okay, well, foo doesn't exist. There is no column called foo. Uh, what if we make a password? Because there is a column called password, right? Ah, see that? I took out the URL encoding, percentage 20. Oh, that's right. I did that. Password. Uh, you know what, it's easy with the space, it'll be your own code. All right, so, oh, come on, select, oh, jeez. Okay, so that's better. But now we've got a different problem because now we have got a collection of passwords and we can't order by a collection of passwords. So in that case, let's just get one password. Let's just get the top one. Right, now, so why has this happened? Because a valid query, right? And actually, for SQL injection, that's a problem because what we want is we want an invalid query, but we want the, the data that we're trying to get out to appear in the exception. So, so here's the here's the trick now, right? So, how would we change this query in order to throw an exception that has the value of the password field in it? Can cat what? Can cat? Send data to the password. You know that it is part of the quick by appending the single. So neither of those will work because they'll just be invalid queries. So we want the query to execute. Well, actually, that one won't work because that would be invalid if you just put a single quote. In fact, we'll show it. It'll say, "Hey, look, it's not right." Okay, unclose quotation mark. So that that's not a valid SQL string. You are saying can cat. So what would we can cat to it? Another string. Yeah. But that would still be, that would probably, but are you trying to concat something to the password value itself? But you're, you're actually heading in the right direction because what if we did this? So what if, let's jump back to where we had a good value. What if we actually tried to multiply the password value by one? That password. Because password is a string. And if you try and multiply a string by an integer, the database will throw an exception and it will say the string that you've tried to multiply is not an integer, you're going to get a cast exception. Hmm. 
And then you can just keep going through this. So that's the first password. So this is a very long way of answering your question. This is what Havoc is doing in the background. This is automating this. That would be the first password. Now, how would you get the second password? You know, you know what happens if you get the top two? You get the same error as what we got before. So instead of yeah. top one, there's a similar top two. You just say they are giving, what give me one response. There's, yes. there's a set of in there, so. You're getting close. So what you can do is subqueries. So you can have a query within a query. So what you do is you say select the top two ascending, and then you wrap another query around that, and you say select the top one descending. So it's like get the top two, then take the top one. Then you do the top three ascending, the top one descending. You see, and you can just kind of enumerate through that. Now, the reason Havage was able to get things like the table names and the column names is because you can select from system tables. So you can select from sys.tables and get a list of all the tables. You can select from sys.columns and get a list of all the columns. So you can just sort of keep going round and round and round like that and actually getting the database to tell you all the things that are actually inside of it. That was a really long answer, but does that answer your question? Um, if you're really interested in how this works as well, you can always run something like Fiddler, like run a proxy whilst you're actually doing this and have a look at the requests it makes. I think sometimes it may have even scrolled off, but sometimes it gives you a bit of an indication. Okay, so see the some of the queries it's running. I know that's really small, but if you want to run this yourself, again, send me an email. I'm troyhunt.hotmail.com, and there's an email link on my blog, and I'll send you a link for the, uh, the Havage. So who wants to go home and teach the kids? <laughs> <laughs> Any other SQL injection questions? Okay, cool. So let's move on. Um, so everyone uh, saw Ashley Madison get hacked. So who had an Ashley Madison account? For research purposes only. For research purposes. <laughs> what about Adult Friend Finder? Everyone see Adult Friend Finder? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said that a little bit too quickly for my comfort. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, this is the interesting thing, and th does everyone know what these sites are? Just Let me just clarify. Um, and now, I did realize, fortunately, whilst I was doing some testing in my hotel room before doing a talk, that you don't log on to these sites anywhere public, because beyond the veneer is stuff that would cause you not to be invited back to talk again. But just as an example, uh, this is what uh, Ashley Madison is all about. Uh, sorry, well, actually, Ashley Madison was the same. But this was um, um, Adult Friend Finder. So they were very explicitly hookup sites. You register here in order to find people to have sex with. So they're pretty sensitive sort of nature. Um, Ashley Madison, frankly, is another level of worse because their whole MO is, probably soon to be was, um, how to cheat on the spouse. So or if, uh, what are they? The, um, well, see, so this is what we're all waiting on because basically what the attackers said, and I'll, I'll show you the, um, I'll find the link. Sorry, sorry. I wrote something about it the other day in my column here, and I linked to the, um, a link to their letter of demand. So basically, they they broke into this site, and then they. Um, so whoever's got the information still got it, haven't have leaked it. Well, allegedly, and you know, and I know that that's like a really sort of crappy kind of caveat. But this is this is basically what they said when they when they dumped it. And look, it goes on and on and on. But in fairness, and I'm saying in fairness to the attacker, Ashley Madison is a whole level of bad. So, you know, first of all, their their really their reason for being is to facilitate affairs, which. You know, okay, we all sort of have our own ethical take for on these sure things, but uh, yeah, life is short. <laughs> um, you know, well, probably most of us would sort of go, this this is not sort of a high moral standard that we wouldn't like to see. So that's number one. Okay, they they're kind of sleazy that way. Uh, number two, what they were doing is they're saying after you sign up on this site, and then you realise you've made a big mistake you need to pay us money in order to remove your data. You need to pay us $17 and we'll take your data away. And then you'll be untraceable. Hmm. Now that is shitty as well, let's be honest. The really shitty thing, however, is that they didn't take the data away. I think they didn't remove that, that $19. Yeah. 
You know what it is. But the two guys sitting on the couch over here, just behind the pillar, they know an awful lot about this. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll get back to that, don't you worry about it. Uh, so that they actually leaked uh, two records here. One is in Ontario and the other one I think is in Michigan. Um, so th this is the sort of data that was still there. These people paid the delete service. And apparently Ashley Madison made about $1.7 million out of the paid delete service that didn't delete the data. And this was kind of the point of this, um, this post I wrote here the other day, which is that Deleting is it's not like that. It's not like I'm just going to delete you out of the database because there are all the web server logs with your IP address, which is considered personally identifiable data depending on where you are. There are the credit card transactions. If they're not the transactions on their end, they're the transactions on your credit card provider. There's all the off-site backups. So you just leave data everywhere. The premise of being able to delete data permanently is absolute bullshit. And clearly, that has ended up being the case. Now, the attacker who broke into their system within this long sort of thing. And by the way, the sort of data that's being leaked is stuff like this, you know, so what their preferences in the bedroom are. So there are different levels of embarrassment there, but clearly if this was legitimate data for someone, it's not the kind of stuff, A, they want to get leaked, uh, B, they want to get leaked and their wife may say it. And let's not sugarcoat it, it's mainly going to be men. So, the attacker, uh, it, the way they've explained it is uh, it's kind of funny because on the one hand they're going, uh, Ashley Madison, you're really shitty for doing this, for charging people money. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have been charging them anything uh, as in sort of defending the people who pay the money. And then on the other hand, he starts ranting on about how bad these people were and low morals and things like that. Um, cheating dirtbags, because they have no such discretion. But the thing is, it's 37 million people which is a very, very large amount of data. And if it does get dumped, and it hasn't been dumped publicly yet, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a really major thing. Um, so get, getting back to where I was going with all this, one of the interesting things with these sites, uh, and I wrote something about this the other day, is that there is there's sort of an assumption that uh, it, it took a data breach in order to disclose the presence of people's accounts. And what we actually find so this was the one I did on Ashley Madison. You could always find the data. You could always find people who had accounts. Because what Ashley Madison were doing is if you try to use the I forgot my password feature, it doesn't make the images bigger. Uh, so you said, you know, this is an invalid email address, uh, send it off. It comes back and says, thank you for your forgotten password request. If that email address exists in our database, you will receive an email to that address shortly. And on the surface of it, that looks good because it's kind of non-committal, right? So maybe you have one, maybe you didn't have one. However, <laughs> when you did have one, this was the message. Now have a look at that. There's the title, there's the bold text. There's the title, there's the bold text. There's all this text box, there's all this other stuff in there. So they were always disclosing the risk. Now, they've since patched this, but you know, when we go here and it says discrete, Encounter. Like, I don't know, like maybe the actual physical encounter is discrete, but the, the fact that you have a presence on the site is not discrete. Now, I was actually doing these demos in my recent travels before actually Madison happened, and I was doing it on the Adult Friend Finder site. Um, oh, you guys are no fun, look at that. <laughs> now, Simon, so I'm, I'm interested. Um, Ashley Madison, you're okay with? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anything you would like to tell the group? I have no idea why that's That's what I would say too. Uh, okay. <laughs> so what did, uh, Adult Friend Finder actually a lot more explicit about it. In fact, I think I think I saved a screen cap for just such occasions. Oh, I'm sure you did. Research purposes. A noisy couch again. So this is what Adult Friend Finder. Uh, we're doing, where if you entered an invalid email, it would tell you this is an invalid email. If you entered a valid email, it would say, we've sent an email. So it was very, very explicit. Uh, so this, is, this sort of leads into an interesting discussion, as we'll, we'll make it a bit more interactive. So who, who has an idea about how we should do this? So clearly Ashley Madison have done it wrong, these guys have done it wrong. What should you do on a password reset if the email address is valid versus invalid? 
two-factor thing. Okay, but that would be at some point where you have to try and just give the same response. Right. Just the same response. The same response. All right. So you and what response would you give? I will mail you the password. If you remember, I'll receive the password, or you will receive the password, depending if you register on the database. Would you mail the password at that point? No. No. You just do a URL link back to the database. But I guess what what I'm saying is that your point is. If they have an email, if the email address exists in the system, you'd send them an email. So would you send it at that point when they click the button and you'd send them an email? Right. Do it afterwards. You do it. So how would you do it afterwards? I mean, what, would, what are the mechanics involved in that? Put in some form of offline view so that you don't have any form of page delay. Oh, interesting. The button. Interesting. Timing attack. So I've, I've got something in draft here, which I can share exclusively. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is email free? Well, the, the, there are multiple interesting things going on here. Um, let's talk about the timing attack thing first, because here's what Simon is saying. And apologies, that's a bit small for some people. But Ashley Madison, when you try to log on with an account that does exist, the green lines are how long it takes. When you try to log on with an account that doesn't exist, the red lines are how long it takes. <laughs> now, can anyone see a pattern here? <laughs> Now, it, it, it's actually a little bit unfortunate for Ashton Madison because the, the reason this is as stark as it is, and just for everyone's reference, it's about 130 milliseconds with an invalid account, and then it's usually between about 500 and, say, 700 milliseconds for a valid account. So we're talking about, you know, maybe like an additional 500 milliseconds. So my, my suspicion is that they have a hashing algorithm which is quite slow. And it's slow because if their details get compromised, if the passwords get compromised, then it's going to be slow for the attacker to crack it. This is what we want to do with hashing algorithms. We don't want to have things like MD5 where you can easily pre-compute or, or compute on the fly like 30 billion a second with consumer hardware. So they've got a nice slow hashing algorithm, which is the right thing to do, except it gives you this, this oracle, if you like, so you know, this sort of a, a, a means of disclosure that tells you whether the account actually exists or not. And this is bloody reliable. Look how solid that red line is. Like, you know, I did not make a single request that wasn't really, really explicitly either good or bad. And of course, I'm testing this with a fake account that I've created that I know exists in the database, and one where it's just goo it at gmail.com. Um, so, so that's a bit of a problem. Now, we got to that point because Simon was making the point about if you were doing password resets and you fired out via SMTP straight away with SMTP being slow, you'd have a problem. Now, there are a couple of things I'd say on that. And in fact, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, let's do this. Let's go to Entropy. So Entropy is an online virtual credit card. And what you can do is go to Forgot Password. And what we'll do is we will try and do a password reset for a made-up account at mailinator.com. Anyone use Mailinator before? All right, so I'm going to show you something else cool here as well. At mailinator.com, submit. We have sent you an email. It's not we might have if you got your information right. Because one of the problems is we end up with so many different email addresses over a long period of time. Some people like to use that sort of plus syntax as well. So, you know, where they say my alias plus website name at gmail.com. You know, it, it's not hard to get your email address wrong. If you don't send an email, you risk someone going, well, what the hell happened? Plus, if you don't send it, you've then got the timing attack thing, because even if it's not SMTP, if there's some other process that adds overhead via one route but not over the other route, you've got a problem. Now, what Mailinator does is you can send a mail to anything you like at mailinator.com, plug it in, and open up the mailbox which is actually kind of cool, right? And there's the email. <laughs> um, now, we'll have a look at the email in a moment, but on Mailinator, and I don't know, like, for some reason, every website I go to advertises for sites to me now. So <laughs> they, could, they could say, like, literally cents. <laughs> I'm not showing that to me. Um, you know better. <laughs> <laughs> Mailinator, uh, you can send anything to blah, 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 at mailinator.com. There are a bunch of sites that block that because they go, well, this is a fake email address. So, <laughs> so MailInator said, well, here's about another 130 domains you can use. So they've actually got <laughs> lots and lots of, it, it is, seriously. So let me look at it. Um, 
hundreds of other domains. So you can see one to here. Very real. <laughs> anyway, so we're we, we enter page. So if we drill into this now, you or someone else enter this email address. However, this email address is not on our database. Now this, to me, is good because even if you've got your email address wrong, this gives you positive feedback. You know, so you can then go, okay, well maybe I used my work email address. Hopefully not fresh for medicine, but for something else. Um, so I, I like the way it gives this feedback. So this kind of then leads into another question. So this this is basically all account enumeration. Account enumeration being I can give an email address to a site and it will come back and it will tell me whether the email address <laughs> exists or not. And if they don't have any anti-automation, like any captures or anything, I can give it a million email addresses and find out if I'm on there. Which was kind of the point with Ashley Madison because you could have just taken, let's say you could have taken the Adobe data breach, 152 million email addresses, which is a nice big set of addresses, and said, just tell me everyone's got an account. And you would have got hundreds of thousands, given that there are 37 million people on Ashley Madison. So what other vectors might there be on a website where you could do this other than password reset? Registration. Right. So registration is another one because you try and register somewhere with an email address and it says you've already registered. So you, you then back into this same sort of loop where you've got to say, okay, well, I need to give the same response and then I need to do verification via the email channel. So the way that I'd be doing this is I'd be mm. saying, uh, okay, everybody gets the same response, which is thank you for registering, you've been sent a verification email. Because verification is something that we'd often do with email because we want to make sure that they did actually want to sign up. Incidentally, <laughs> there's an Ashley Madison angle to everything here. Apparently Ashley Madison has no email verification. So of those 37 email addresses, when you see your significant other on there, if you see a significant other on there, it doesn't mean that they've signed up. It could have been anyone who signed up. So if anyone wants to register like, you know, like Simon.wait or whatever, <laughs> they can do that because there's no verification. So when the data gets leaked, there's nothing in there that says, Yes, this person did actually acknowledge that they wanted an account. That's my, that's my excuse. That's, that's your excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I reckon that would be a massively popular blog post. Here's how to explain your Ashley Madison account to your significant other. There are all these. Um, I, I'm not sure how how sort of internet fabricated they were, but you know memes going around about Tiffany's having bumper sales and yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. that sort of thing afterwards. Who knows? So yeah, with registration you do the same sort of thing. You give the same response, you say I've sent you a verification email, and then the verification email can be used A, to make sure the person did actually want an account, uh, and B, if they already had an account in there, you could say, hey look, you actually already have an account uh, you, with this email address. So you can go and do a password reset if you've forgotten what it is. And you know, when you think about it, how often does this happen, right? So this is going to be a very, very small fraction of registrations where someone legitimately tries to register and they already have an account. So for the sake of, I don't know, 5% hypothetically of people to then be told, well actually, you know, a minute later when the email arrives you already have an account, I reckon that's a pretty good trade-off. Okay, any, uh, any other questions around enumeration? All right, so let's go on to something more interesting. I'm, I'm conscious of time as well. I might keep talking, so I'm going to show you this one, and, and hopefully this will get everyone scared and worried. Actually, scared and entertained is always the goal, so let's look into that. Um, does everyone see, I, I had this little thing on the desk. So who's seen one of these, other than the security guy, other than you guys? Pine? Is it a porcupine? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a bloody porcupine. It's a pineapple, you idiot. Oh, well, <laughs> close. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so th this is a pineapple. It's um, it's a Wi-Fi pineapple, and what you do is you get this for a hundred dollars on the internet, which is now like a hundred and thirty dollars on the internet. Thank you, AUD. Uh, and it is uh, it's another penetration testing tool, and it's it's really a, a little embedded uh, Linux device that runs on a piece of hardware that's got a couple of wireless adapters on it, and it's got a wired adapter as well, hence plugged into my device, and I can log into it because it's got its own little web server. And I'm actually running this. Let me have a look. In fact, we'll see if the network's there. Yeah, it is. Now, I've called this Betsy's free Wi-Fi. Oh, it just disappeared. 
was there a moment ago? It may come in and out a bit. But you know what I'm going to do? Let me actually show you why I've called it Betsy's Free Wi-Fi, because we should set some context around why Wi-Fi matters. If anyone wants to watch this whole presentation as well, as where I've got all these interesting screen grabs, um, this was Making Hacking Child's Play. It's on my blog. It was recorded on Vimeo. Uh, so let's max this up a little bit, and we'll have a look at Betsy. Probably going to be a little bit hard to hear, but Betsy is a seven-year-old, and she's explaining how she's using her laptop here, where she sees lots of numbers and signs, and he's explaining how she's pretending to be the cafe Wi-Fi and hijacking everyone's connections. <laughs> so, <laughs> there are several really interesting things with this. Um, one is that, did you notice she was drinking coffee? <laughs> 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 yeah. The other is that she's using Wireshark <coughs> on the machine. Now, I'm, uh, I'm clearly no longer seven, and, and I look at Wireshark and it confuses the hell out of me, <laughs> because this is like deep level packet capture analysis stuff, it's, it's heavy duty. Uh, so this is a, is a very, very contrived video, but it does set an interesting scene in terms of how easy is it to actually hijack Wi-Fi. So let's get back to this little device again. Um, so before we saw on my network connection we had Betsy's free Wi-Fi. That may drop in and out, and I'll show you why it might drop in and out in a moment. When I go and I have a look at my, uh, where were we now? So network, access point. I've actually set it up here as Betsy's free Wi-Fi. Now, one of the things I can do with this is I can create a wireless hotspot and give it any name I like, and then I can route the connection through another hotspot. It's got two different NICs in it. So one of them could be connected to, to here, to the guest Wi-Fi, and the other one could be the one that's called Betsy's Free Wi-Fi, and people are connecting, and then their traffic, hypothetically, goes like in one aerial and then out the other aerial and back out to the web. So effectively, all your traffic passes through there. Now, you might be wondering why would somebody connect to Betsy's free Wi-Fi? And the hint <laughs> is in the free bit. <laughs> when, when I run this at conferences, I stand it up, I call it free NSA Wi-Fi. The number of people that connect to free IQ, you know, there's always people that connect to free NSA Wi-Fi because they pull it up and they go Wi-Fi and I say free and it's like they just stop reading. So everything else is just, I'm not even looking at it. What you would do if you were perhaps a little more malicious is you would call it free cafe Wi-Fi, whatever the cafe name is, or free airport Wi-Fi. And you know, I mean, on that, who here connects to free Wi-Fi? Open Wi-Fi. Yeah, you all waited till I did, didn't you? <laughs> but we do this because it is such a massive convenience. It's like that. Uh, what is that? Marcos um, Pyramid of Needs or something. Where it's like food, water, <laughs> shelter, Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. If I connect to free Wi-Fi, but if I use a VPN. Ah, good question. So if you connect to free Wi-Fi, but if you use a VPN, uh, is it okay? Yes, and I'm going to show you that at the end. In fact, I'll show you which VPN I use too. Um, but this is the thing. We all look for free Wi-Fi. Windows, Windows tends to make it easy and easier to connect to the network using Wi-Fi sense. Oh yeah, you don't even need to. You don't even need to agree for anything. You know the problem is when you connect to Wi-Fi, then it takes you. No, particular tick box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're on 4G, then that comes before that even connects. Let's. I tell. You, let's come back to that. The Windows 10 thing. I don't know how many people have seen it, but it has copped a huge amount of place on the net. It has been hammered. And I haven't looked at the implementation, but what I read in the news, which I have, a, I guess, some degree of confidence in, it looks terrible, you know, in terms of this, this promiscuous nature of connecting to wireless hotspots. Now, we'll talk about what you can do with that, but let me take you through the rest of this for a moment. So this is one thing, right? You can stand it up as a wireless hotspot, and you could almost sort of go, well, if someone connects to a hotspot and it's malicious, well, shame on them, but we all do it, right? Now, I'm going to turn on a few other things, because we'll start to look at the fun stuff now. So. One of the things that uh, a lot of people don't realize about their devices is, you know how uh, when you all go home tonight, your phones and your tablets and whatever will connect automatically, right? And then you get to the office tomorrow, and your phones and your tablets and everything will connect automatically. And it's really, really convenient, which is great, because it's just so easy to jump in and connect to stuff. 
The way they do that is these devices keep broadcasting, and they broadcast what's called probe requests. And this is what I'm now capturing. And the probe requests tell the network what they're looking for. So you're just sending out all these probe requests. Where's this network and that network and that network? Now that I've turned these on, we can all do like an interactive exercise. So if you pull out your device and have a look at the Wi-Fi networks that are around you. I actually had mine turned off. That was smart. What kind of Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi. Some people knew it was coming. Now while you're looking at your networks, I might look at your networks as well. Uh, so who's seeing some interesting networks? Burger King. You got a Burger King here? <laughs> On the 14th floor? Yeah, second line of business. <laughs> but when you look at this, you'll see like a ridiculous number of Wi-Fi networks, right? <laughs> Someone's been to Ottenham Home Beach probably. And then when you look at the screen here, <laughs> you'll see, oh wow, there's a Windows phone here. Who's got a Windows phone? You're the guy. Oh. <laughs> now, are you connected? to FRNSW oh. because at the moment there is a Windows phone that is connected to my device. So who's got a win there, there can't be another one here, surely. Oh well, wow, there's two guys. This is like the greatest gathering of Windows phones ever. <laughs> uh, are we still recording? Yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> uh, what's on it? So so here's the thing. Someone with a Windows phone, which is a very creatively named Windows phone, uh, has actually connected through to this network, FRNSW. Now, I, I shouldn't laugh too much because my iPhone <laughs> has also connected through to this one, and I have no idea why I've connected to that one. Like, where was I when I connected to that? Um, Do you know what Honors is? H H O N O R S. No idea. Is it some of your best? Oh, Hilton. Yeah. Two so, so now there's. Huh. Is that right. you um, with the the blue ren iPhone six? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but you didn't deliberately connect to this. But no. your phone automatically connected to H Honors. Yeah. So you uh, So that's why you look at your phone and go, what? It's <laughs> H Honors. No, I knew. I, yeah. Know what you're doing there. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so here's the interesting thing. We can now go and have a look at things like um, all the other networks that are being broadcast. So here are all the networks that's presently broadcast based on the networks that you are broadcasting, which is rather a lot. Oh, I get oh, one. It's scary, yeah, it's isn't it? It's all the probes. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that's right. But they're all the probes. Um, oh, shoot. Now, what, what's interesting is sometimes you can see some really interesting ones like Ashley Madison or, <laughs> <laughs> or similar. Yeah. You, you might not see them all at once because I think your device can only read so many, and I'm not sure if this has to sort of prioritize them as well. So basically, it picks up that we're broadcasting something and then turns around and pushes yep. it back. And you know, this, this was me. This was, um, I was on the train in the Netherlands a few weeks ago, and it was Wi Fi in yeah. the train. And that's. That's you being picked up on that. That'll be me. Someone's been to Berlin. I assume. Who's been to Berlin? Whose phone has been to Berlin? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the other thing. Or it might be something else. Oh, Microsoft yeah. Open. There's a classic. All right. Well, yeah. <laughs> that, that's plenty of this. Now, the other thing is we can look at this karma log. And what the karma log will give us, actually we'll go over here to log, is it will give us all of your devices and what they're probing for. So now we can do it by MAC address. So, for example, this MAC address looks like the same all the way down here. So now we can try and guess who's been to all these places. Please ask staff for password. That's a good network name, isn't it? <laughs> so whoever has this MAC address, does this look like your... And we're going to need to zoom in on this because some of you have been to some really, really odd places, I might say. <laughs> now, now whoever owns this is not going to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's just it's like a place in France, so you know it's, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> not fabricated at all. <laughs> but you can go through and you can see who's connecting to what. So uh, maybe Grant, have you been? Because you you went no, to Hilton. 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 Yeah. I, I know you probably don't know your Mac address off by heart, but maybe it was that one as well. Because this one is actually trying to associate, so it's actually found the network and now it's trying to latch onto it. 
which makes it kind of interesting. I looked again. Jeez. <laughs> this guy's got around. It's not the guys on the couch, is it? <laughs> 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 That's just like a window based on one device. It's not showing two at the moment. Android device is showing a lot. Yeah, so. Well, like. like so the Windows device is not showing much, but the Android device, the thing that's always in the news with the malware, is... Yeah. yeah, right. Um, different devices seem to have different levels of, of promiscuity, for want of a better word, where uh, I find particularly Apple devices, uh, including OS X devices, connect very, very easily. Uh, I find the Windows stuff doesn't do that as much. Either the Windows desktops or the, uh, or the Windows mobile devices don't connect quite as eagerly. So it's, it, it's kind of a bit of a mixed bag. Um, now, so here's the interesting thing. Let's start talking about why this is relevant. Mm. Because it's a good party trick, but there is actually some relevance to all this as well. So the, the reason I normally show this is primarily to talk about why we need HTTPS. So why we need secure socket layer, which we used to call it, which we should now call it TLS, Transport Layer Security, but basically HTTPS. Because this is how easy it is. So you know, in Grant's case, he, he didn't do anything. His phone just connected. And I'm sure if we go back to the clients, there'll probably be other clients that have connected without people even knowing, uh, because that's just what the devices do. You don't have to take that out of your pocket. So we need to have this secure transport layer, because it's so easy to end up with someone getting in the middle of the traffic. Every now and then, this thing just completely gives up if there are enough devices in a, a small proximity <laughs> as well. Um, I think I have uh, three, maybe four different connected devices here, so mm -hmm. assuming other people are similar. So HTTPS is important. So there are different ways that we can approach HTTPS as well in terms of doing it right or, or doing it wrong. And I'll give you a couple of resources. So one of the things that, that is actually kind of useful is um, these SSL labs. So everyone's seen this one, SSL tests? Like this is really, really handy. So what you can do is you can plug in something like have I been pwned.com, oops, dot in there, and say go away and test my SSL. Now I'm just going to clear the cache and see if this gets any better, and then I'm going to explain why it's so bad. So what's happening here is this service here, and it's run by Qualys, goes away and it actually makes a whole bunch of different requests, and it looks at things like uh, will the site support SSL3? So for example, if I make a request as a client, and I say, I cannot talk over any of the new TLSs, I can only talk over SSL, will the site actually serve content? It's not hacking the site, it's just making legitimate requests and saying, how are you going to respond? What you'll find is that there are a bunch of websites that do really, really badly with their SSL implementation. And I'll give you an example of just how bad some of them are. Do you really want bank grade security in your SSL? So here are the banks I tested. Aussie banks. And they all get graded, right? A, A minus, B, C, F. And our banks just did atrociously. And there were a bunch of people who read this and then they went and tested banks in their country. And, and oddly enough, other than the Netherlands, where that Harlem Shake video came from, most of them did very, very similar. So a bunch of Fs, a bunch of Cs, Bs. And the reason why they're scoring so bad, if you look at some of these column headings, is it's things like still supporting SSL3. So we basically turned SSL3 off after the first round of Poodle vulnerabilities in about October last year. So no one should be using SSL today. We still had ANZ using SSL3. Uh, St. George, all of these guys using SSL3. You know, it's, it, it's ridiculous. Even, I think, um, IE... IE7 onwards supports TLS 1.0 on Europe. So, you know, it's, it's crazy to support it. Um, we had some of them still supporting RC4. And since this is an Azure meetup, let's, uh, let's bag Azure for a little bit. Because if I go back here, I still get a B on my site. And I get all of these hardcore security people emailing me like I'm some kind of kitten killer because I've got a B rating on my SSL for have I been pwned. And the reason why it's kept to be is Azure still supports the RC4 cipher. So SSL certificates, there's a bunch of different nuts and bolts that go in there. What sort of ciphers do they support? What are the intermediate certificates? What's the key strength? There's a lot of different attributes to SSL. And, and people sort of see HTTPS, and they often don't realize how much more actually goes into it. 
that's what makes this um, this report really interesting. Now, in a case like this, the problem is is that if you have an Azure website, they terminate SSL in front of it. So there is, colloquially speaking, and of course there's many of these, but there's a device in front of it which terminates the SSL, and then there's a segment of the network which is clear until it hits your web server. Now, you can control what's on your web server, but you can't control what's in front of it, which is the SSL. Now, they are in the process of turning this off. So they started turning it off weekend before last. Uh, and when I say turning it off, they're disabling RC4, they're implementing some stronger ciphers, they're changing the, uh, the implementation such that this should now be an A-grade. And it's, a, it's sort of a gradual roll and change. But a lot of people got very, very uppity about the way, uh, the way Microsoft are handling this. Now, incidentally, if you have any sort of infrastructure as a service, whether it be Windows on Azure or anything else, then you have control usually over your SSL termination. You're usually be terminating on the site, and you can turn on ciphers, turn off ciphers, enable any sort of stuff you want. But when you're using a platform as a service, then you're at the mercy of whatever the platform is using. Now, I'll give you another couple of examples of some interesting things. So let me try this. So we're running through the pineapple at the moment. Let's try and go to American Express. Right. So why does this happen? Because American Express, if you go to American Express on your device, you will see that it will load up HTTPS. So how could we do this with American Express? Well, this one here's not going over. Yeah, that's right. We're not even checking a certificate. So Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, let's see. Let's, uh, no, it's not a DNS change. Let's try, let's try the FBI. Oh, well, that one actually works. Ah, you know, I bet it is. What if I try the insecure scheme? Ah, interesting. I can explain what I've done, actually. So here's the thing. When you go to... It's not just American Express, it's many others. If you try and go to, say, um, we'll go back to Dance and Dana for, for impact. <laughs> if you try and go to www.americanexpress.com or www.anything or anything in the address bar without explicitly specifying a scheme, then the browser will default to HTTP. So it'll be an HTTP request which is insecure. Now, what will normally happen is the site will then get the HTTP request and it will say, OK, I only want to serve HTTPS. I want to do everything securely. So if you pull out your phone and you type American Express, you might just see the URL flick, because it will go HTTP, respond with a 301 and the location attribute in the header, which says, now go to HTTPS, and then it will do another request, and then it will be loaded securely. But the initial request still puts you at risk. And if you're running through a device like this, then it can get you. Now, here is something interesting. Well, this one. This one works. Straight through to HTTPS. So let's talk about why this works. If I open up the dev tools and I hit F12, and we might just try explicitly going over HTTP again. So have a look at the request. The first request up here. Okay, so this will be this row, the one in blue. Returns a 307, which it says in an internal redirect. A 307 internal redirect. Also notice the latency, two milliseconds. That's a pretty quick request, <laughs> two milliseconds. And then there's a request here, which if we drill down on it, shows that it will be an HTTPS request. So what causes this? What causes a 307 internal redirect? HSTS. HSTS, right. So who, who, who has seen HSTS before? Simon, the guy without the CSPs on his website. Um, all right, so let's talk about HSTS. This response here, so this has been the request to the secure scheme. It has actually gone through to the server. The server's responded. If we go down into my headings here, I have one called, my headers, strict transport security. So strict transport security, otherwise known as HSTS, so HTTP, strict transport security, it is just another response header. So it is like CSPs insofar as it is just a response header. And what the response header does is it comes back with three attributes. So one is the max age. And the max age is 3 million something, which is the number of seconds in a year, roughly speaking. 
It also says include subdomains. So apply this rule to any subdomains of hellobankcone.com. And it also says preload. Now I'll talk about preload in a moment, but what the other attributes do is they mean that once this header has been returned to the browser, for the period of the max age, the browser will no longer be able to make an HTTP request to the website. So that's why when I tried to go to HTTP up here, the browser said, nah, -uh, I've got an HSTS. You're not allowed to make an HTTP request. You're going to have to make an <laughs> HTTPS request. And that's why it redirected internally, which only took two milliseconds, and then it made this request. So the HSTS header disallows HTTP. Now what that means is the next time that I type in have I been pwned.com without a scheme, it's just going to go straight to HTTPS. It also means that if I accidentally, say, embedded an image on the site and requested it over HTTP, which would have sent things like my auth cookie over in the secure uh, connection, the browser would say, no, you're not allowed to do that, and it converts it automatically to HTTPS. So it's like a safeguard, but like CSP, it's also a browser implementation. So the browser is the one that says, I've seen that header, Here's what we're going to do. Now, the preload one is interesting as well because what you can do is you can Google HSTS preload and you can go to the HSTS preload submission page and you can enter a site like this. And what this does is, first of all, this site is run by Chromium. It is used to say, I want to force browsers to only have requests as securely. So not even make the first insecure request because if you have never been to haveibeenpwned.com and you go to your browser and you type in haveibeenpwned.com, it will go over HTTP and then it will respond securely and it will respond with the HSTS header. What the preload does is it allows the browser vendor to actually hard code this into the browser. So there are a whole bunch of websites which are now being preloaded, hard coded into the browser. So when you update your Chrome, which seems to happen once a week at the moment, you will actually get certain websites that are baked into it. You will not ever be able to request them insecurely. Now that's really good because it takes away that first opportunity to make the insecure request. And you see here there's a bit of criteria a bit further down about what you need to do. You have to have a valid certificate. You have to redirect your traffic to be HTTPS only, all this sort of stuff. But basically there are rules in place to say that you know if you qualify, and you're returning that preload header, we will make sure that your site can never be requested in security. Which is cool. Any questions on this? I think there's like minor bewildered looks in yeah. some places. Yeah. I'm using WebAPI as an open organization. So what's the, where's the best way to see that token? Because that's also WebAPI like browsing. Should be accessed. It's a course not. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, like that is it, that is it's a good question. It's a very tangential question. There is a course I have called um, Angular Security, and in Angular Security, talk about uh, bearer tokens and storing them in local storage and other things like that. But it's it's a very tangential question to one of HTTPS. So just sticking on HSTS for a moment, has anyone got any questions about HSTS or? Uh, Secure transport layers or pineapples. Does anyone want to see who else was snared with a pineapple? <laughs> That's usually what everyone wants to see. Oh, bug me out. <laughs> Don't turn your phones off, man. You heard it. This, this is a bit... Wow, I think it actually rebooted. It's, it's, like, it's unselected everything. No clients. So, yeah, like I said, it can be a little bit flaky. Um, so, We'll talk about what we can do with HTTPS or rather without HTTPS a little bit more. So some of the things we can do is obviously when you're routing someone's traffic, you can observe it. So we talked about confidentiality before. You can see auth tokens. You can see usernames and passwords when they log in. Um, so there's those things. We could modify it as well. And when we talk about modifying traffic, that could mean several things. So the American Express was a digging a spoof. So you make a request for a resource and effectively it redirects that request somewhere else. So you still see the domain name that's actually routed the traffic through to another location. So what you might do, and a legitimate penetration testing purpose with something like this, is you send up a phishing page. So you go into an organization, you turn it on, you put in the home page of the organization, you, know, you, you take a copy of it, you stand it up on this device, 
we grab the traffic there and then we say, I need your username and password. And then people enter it in. There's actually a whole ecosystem of apps you can add into this. It's like a little app store. We've got a little bit called the pineapple bar, which is kind of cool. And you go into the pineapple bar, and actually this may not load because I'm not routing the traffic from here through the network. But you can go into the pineapple bar and sort of choose apps. So at the moment I'm running VNS Boost, I'm running Random Roll. And the Random Roll is where we can then go in here and say, well, look, every time someone makes a request, I want to show them Rick Astley, Ninkat, no, you choose. And that is the way that one works. And I think everyone has been turning off their phones. <laughs> oh, it's just me. Damn it. <laughs> I'm going to leave it running while we, while we wrap up, though. Um, I'm conscious we've been going for a couple of hours. So does anyone have any general sort of security questions? Is it the bank, um, the issues with all the bank uh, sites? Um, is, is, are they knowingly doing that, do you think? Um, is it browser culture they're going for? Or? Now it's my iPad as well. Jesus. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so, yep. so this is a good question. I'm, I'm going to write something on this because it's actually quite intriguing. Um, AMP, it's got a little thing next to it. Rating now improves. See the edit above the table. If we go up, the day after I posted this, I think I posted this one night, and the next morning I had an email from AMP. And of course, <laughs> the first thing after writing about something like this is you go, oh shit, no, I'm trying. <laughs> what, what are they going to do? But they were really, really good. And in fact, the, um, what they said is, look, we just want to let you know that uh, we fixed this. So well, what do you mean? Like, I wrote about it yesterday. And everyone else keeps telling me how hard it is <laughs> to, to secure their SSL. And they're like, no, look, honestly, we, we fixed it. And um, there, there was an interesting follow-on from that. So I was at the, the Ossert conference in the Gold Coast probably six weeks ago, and the guy from AMP came up to me. And I, I, again, I thought, oh, shit, I'm in trouble again. Um, but it, what he said was, look, that, this was really good because the security guys know all this. Like, this is, this is not rocket science for... Developers who don't live in this world, a lot of people see this and go, well, that's really interesting, I didn't know that. But for the guys that live and breathe this stuff, but they know it inside and out. But when they go to the higher ups and they say, we need to disable SSL3 because of the poodle bug and potential attack articles again, like someone there is just going, well, how much money will it cost us and what will it make us? You know, and it, it just sort of doesn't get through. And what he was saying is that um, once it actually gets some airtime and it gets some pressure, Stuff just happens, you know. So they know it and they want to do it, but the problem is sometimes they just they just need a pro. Um, I had another one very similar to this actually. I'm going off a tangent now, but it's kind of interesting. Where I wrote about uh, Betfair. In fact, this one was awesome. <laughs> so, so Betfair, uh, what Betfair were doing? So Betfair is a large betting agency in the UK. They've got a presence in Australia as well. <laughs> they had this idea where they said. Um, if you want to reset your password, because password resets are too hard, we're going to make it easier. And what you do is you enter your email address and your birthday. And that is all. <laughs> now you put in your password. And this guy here is a journo in the UK. There's this thread. It's like you have to read it to blue. It's just amazing because he's, he's saying on Twitter, so on the public timeline, to the Betfair support, look, I can reset my account just by knowing my email address and my password, which is pretty well-known stuff. And Betfair is berating him like there's some really obnoxious person on the Twitter account, um, you know, being really, really inappropriate. Um, and <laughs> the crux of what the Betfair account was saying uh, was, well, uh, your username is private. You shouldn't share it with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's like, it's my email address. <laughs> that's, that, that's how I get email, right? Um, and then they're like, yeah, well, you shouldn't be sharing your birthday with anyone either. So. Oh, I like presents and cake <laughs> and this sort of stuff. But um, I recorded a walkthrough where I went through and I video because basically Betfair is saying, no, it can't happen. And I looked at it and anyone could look at this and it's, it's just the basic workflow, like create an account, try and reset your password. Hey, it only wants your email address and your, uh, your birthday. So I recorded it and published it and then like literally the day after or two days after it was all fixed. And then when I was at a conference overseas, I, I did a talk. 
and afterwards a guy came up to me and he handed me a card and it was Betfair. Oh shit, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but he said the same thing. He was like, look, we really, really appreciate you writing that. Um, we couldn't get traction on that. You know, that they didn't want to fix this ridiculously stupid fundamental flaw. But as soon as it got airtime, I fixed it. So that's sort of two very long examples in answer to your question where most of the time the security people know this. But many of us have probably worked in big organizations before. We know it can be very hard to get the right thing done because you just haven't you just haven't pushed the right buttons in order to get progress on it, which is a, a shitty thing to be and you know they, they copped a bit of a hiding for it. So, you know, fair enough. Now they fixed it. Cool. I think I think we might might wrap it up there. Cool. Um, I'm sure Troy's going to be around taking up after this. If you guys want to ask me some questions, or one we can. Thanks a lot for uh, coming on tonight, guys, and thanks a lot, Troy, for the session tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Mate. I got, I got Grant again. You did. <laughs> Every time it goes on there, I go forget network. <laughs> now, see, CC's big phone has deliberately connected to Betsy's Wi Fi. Um, Oh, and I'm going to leave these um, these passes over here. So before you get out, grab a pass, and that'll get you access uh, for a month to over 4,000 courses on Thrillside as well.